very much, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so my background is all in the world of Formula One, as you just heard there. I was a mechanic, uh, part of the pit stop crew at the McLaren Formula One team for almost 10 years, uh, before then moving into team management. And what I'm here today to talk to you about is how, uh, how this can somehow relate to your world, to the world of re retail. So I'm going to talk about building great teams, high-performing teams, successful teams. Uh, I'm going to talk about the attention to detail that Formula One does very, very well, about how Formula One puts... Uh, brand, puts its brand or its brand recognition at the very forefront of everything it does. And I hope there'll be some lessons from that that you might be able to take away from it at the end. Um, just quickly, who follows Formula One in the audience? Quick, a few of you, well done, that's great. Um, okay, well, let's look at how a Formula One team is made up because if you're not necessarily a fan of the sport, they're, they're often a bit bigger perhaps than you might be aware of. Um, each one, of course, has their, their, their two drivers. So the two drivers are the most public figureheads, if you like, of each of those 10 Formula One teams and there's 10 teams in Formula One right now but there are also 10 businesses that like any other business have to perform both on the racetrack but also in terms of in a business sense they need to return make a return on, on the investment that people have put into it so the drivers are, the, are very much the public face of those organizations I was very fortunate to be at McLaren when Lewis Hamilton came into the sport and he was put into this this world of Formula One, if you like, thrust onto this world stage almost overnight. And he was just a kid at the time. And I remember being at the team when he turned up and, and being, well, surprised for one, because most people had never really heard of him. He'd been put onto this global platform as this young kid. Obviously, he was very quick in a racing car, but he was super young. He was super cool. He was good looking. He was the first black Formula One driver as well. And I remember at the time people talking about his potential being huge. People talking about him in the same breath as people like Tiger Woods. He could be as big as Tiger Woods, they were saying. In the end, it turned out Lewis was a better driver. Come on. It's the only joke, so there you go, out of the way. Um, the point I'm going to go on to make, though, is that Lewis Hamilton, just two years after turning up on this, this global platform of F1 as this young kid, became world champion just two years later. And of course, he didn't do that on his own. He did that with the help of a huge number of people working away behind the scenes to give him that opportunity. And I'm very proud to say that I was one of those. If we look at a bit deeper into the team, though, um, this is the pit stop crew, of course, that uh, most people will at least be in some way familiar with. And those gr group of people there, 20 guys, however many it is, come together maybe four, five or six times during every Grand Prix to change the wheels and tyres in the, the staggering speeds that if you do follow the sport, you'll be familiar with. I'm going to go into pit stops in a little bit more depth in a moment. But without every single one of those people, every member of that team doing their bit to as close to perfection as it can possibly be done at exactly the right moment, well then that pit stop can't be a winning pit stop. And Lewis Hamilton doesn't get the opportunity to, to win Grand Prix and certainly not to challenge for world titles. So every one of those people has an absolutely crucial role to play in the outcome, which for us is to, to get the best result we can out of the race. Um, this is what we would call the travelling race team, so about 60 or 70 guys who travel to every Grand Prix. You may not see them all on the television if you turn on the TV and watch the sport on a Sunday, because often they're buried away in the back of the garages, but all there helping to make absolutely crucial and critical decisions as the race is unfolding, about when to make a pit stop, which tyres to go on, which setup the car should be operating on. So again, every single one of them, although not front and centre, every single one of these people plays an absolutely critical role in the outcome of a Formula One Grand Prix. And certainly without them all doing their bit, Lewis Hamilton just cannot be world champion. If you look a bit further, and this is perhaps the bit that lots of people are not familiar with when you, when you think of Formula One. This is uh, McLaren's factory. This is where I used to work, down in Woking in Surrey. Inside that impressive looking building, there's about 800 people all working towards the Formula One project. So 800 people all working to get two cars onto the grid on a Sunday to give those two drivers the opportunity to win races and challenge for world titles. 800 people doing a whole variety of different jobs. And as I said, there's 10 teams in Formula One. They're all trying to do the same thing. They've all got big, shiny factories and huge facilities, great resources. They've all got lots and lots of people, but they're all trying to do the same thing. They're all trying to build, design, manufacture two racing cars that on a Sunday afternoon, they'll get onto the racetrack and compete in the most public way possible for the best results they can. So everyone's trying to achieve the same target. So like with any business in any small and particularly uh, you know, competitive market sector, you've got to find a way to stand out from the crowd. You've got to find a way to, to differentiate your business from the competition. Because if you're not different, if you don't do anything different to the competition, 
well, well then you're just the same. And why does anybody choose you? Why does a customer choose you? Why does an investor choose you? So we had to find a way to stand out. And at McLaren, under the leadership of, of my old boss and those who followed the sport for years will know a guy called Ron Dennis, the former CEO of McLaren. He ran that place. In fact, he ran that place with an iron fist. He had unbelievable attention to detail. In fact, he had OCD, if I'm really honest, he had OCD. And that was a difficult place to work. When I was working in that building, you know, we, we often felt like we were spending more time polishing things or cleaning our desks than we ever did trying to make a racing car go more quickly. But when you step back, and I only managed to do this after a period of time, step back and look at actually what was happening here. What Ron was doing was creating a differentiator because our organization, McLaren, we stood out from the crowd because of the way we portrayed ourselves, the way we presented ourselves. So that meant that the way that our factory looked. If you ever got, were lucky enough to sort of get a tour of the inside of this building, you can't help but be wowed when you open the, the factory doors. And I've got some pictures to show you of the inside in a moment. But it was the same at a Formula One Grand Prix. If you were walking down the pit lane at a Grand Prix, you can't help but have your head turned towards the McLaren garage because of the way it's presented. The cars are always in the, in the most immaculate way presented in the garage. Even the people, the personnel within that organization are always spotless and immaculate. And I'll give you an example. When I was a mechanic, bear in mind I was a mechanic at this point, I was working away in the McLaren garage. At the start of every season, we'd have this first day of January after coming back after Christmas, we'd have this particularly nervous moment where we'd have to go into the clothing department of the McLaren team, which is in the basement of this building, to find out what our team kit was going to be for the year. So this was the designers at Hugo Boss, one of our partners, and our marketing department. Whatever they had dreamt up for us to be wearing, that's, that was what we were going to be wearing. We had no choice in this, and whatever it was, we'd be wearing it every day for the next year. So first day of January, we'd head down to the clothing department, tentatively open up this cardboard box with our team kit in it, and invariably, as a mechanic, bear in mind, there would be white shirts in this box. Now, you can imagine as a mechanic, that's the last thing you want to find is a white shirt because you're going to get filthy, aren't you? Of course we were. And of course we did. But the point was here that Ron wanted his team to always look immaculate and professional. So if we got our white shirts dirty, which of course we did at times, we'd have to run out the back of the garage to another great big box of spare brand new white shirts and go and put another one on. And the point was that Ron didn't ever want any photos or any video TV coverage of his team looking anything other than immaculate. And if you look back at old photos of the McLaren organization, at pretty much any point under Ron's tenure as, as CEO, that's exactly how it looked. Spotless and immaculate at all times. So that was the thing that stood us apart from the rest of Formula One. And I say that because I'm telling you, that, that really tells you what uh, a level we used to go to because Formula One is an industry where attention to detail is prevalent right across the board. In fact, it's an industry more akin to the aerospace industry than it actually is the automotive industry that might be the more natural assumption. And that's because of our level, the forensic level of attention to detail that we went to. Now, I'm telling you this because a few years ago when I was working at the team, we went through a period of change within Formula One that we at McLaren dealt with far better than anybody else in the sport. And as a result of that, we came out on top of everybody. We created ourselves a huge advantage. And the change, just to briefly give you some background, the change is that when the European Union banned tobacco advertising, it affected Formula One massively because for a number of years up until that point, F1 had been almost entirely bankrolled through sponsorship by the tobacco industry. And we had been for quite a few years the last place that the tobacco industry could go to advertise their product on the global scale that we in F1 could offer. Now that was a wonderful time to be in F1 because at that point in time we had more money coming into our industry and certainly into our organisation at McLaren, more money than cents, definitely more money than cents. We had more money than ways we could dream up to spend it because we didn't have to work very hard for that income or that investment into our team because the tobacco company couldn't go anywhere else. So they were knocking on our door wanting to hand over a check for hundreds of millions of dollars in exchange for a sticker on the side of the car that went that, you know, that big that we stuck on the side of the car paraded around the world you know, in front of hundreds of millions of TV viewers. And that was our business model for a long time. Easy business model, didn't have to work for it. It was people coming to us. We, had, we, we became utterly complacent. So when the European Union come along and say, right, this is gonna go, tobacco advertising is stopping, 
you can imagine, it sent shockwaves through the entire F1 world. Now, when I was getting into Formula One, which is my dream job, all I'd ever wanted to do was get into F1. I eventually got my job at McLaren at 22 years old, so I was just a kid myself, really. And I turned up in this world where, you know, there was more money going around than I'd ever seen in my life. We were flying private aviation to races. We were staying in the, the most amazing hotels. We had some incredible parties. <laughs> um, so when the European Union come along and say, right, this is stopping, the tobacco advertising is coming to an end. You can imagine people panicked, people worried. Um, people were worrying about how it was gonna affect our industry. People thought actually, there were lots of people writing in the industry magazines that this could spell the end for some of the Formula One teams. Some people even predicted it could be the end of Formula One. That's how significant a threat to the industry this was being seen as. Now I remember thinking, reading these articles, thinking I'm, wor you know, I'm worried about my job. How's my team gonna survive this, this massive threat? And I remember thinking that, you know, if we survived, surely there's going to be cutbacks, you know, it's going to be a difficult time. If we're going to make cutbacks, us, the race team, the pit stop crew, that what we class as the front line of our organisation, well, if you're going to start making cutbacks, we're going to be the ones perhaps most severely affected. It's going to start affecting our results. And results was everything in Formula One. And so, well, if I'm really honest, my first thought when I heard about this was that the private jets and the parties were going to go. <laughs> but after that, I started thinking about results. Um, but then Ron Dennis came to us one day and he gathered us all together in the factory and I'll never forget the day. And he said, look guys, I appreciate you'll all be worried about this, this time we're going through these worrying stories in the, in, the, in the press. He said, I want you to, I'm here to gather you here today to, to kind of join with me because you know, I'm telling you that over the last six months, every other Formula One team, every other stakeholder in F1 has been knocking on my door, has been ringing my phone asking me, asking us as McLaren, to join this growing group, this forum of people who are going off in this direction, desperately trying to fight back against the EU, trying to cling on to this, this con, you know, complacency, this easy stream of income they've had for so long. He said, we are the last team not to join that growing fight back. And he said, the reason we're not joining it is because it's the way I see it, is if they have any success in this, the best they might get is a, a th maybe a three-year extension to this ruling about advertising tobacco products. They're never going to be able to advertise tobacco products forever, clearly. He said, so if they go off in that direction and get some success, in three years' time, they'll all be turning around and coming back in this direction, which I want us to go in now and find a new way of doing things. Use it not as a threat. Don't see it as a threat, but see it as an opportunity to do something a bit differently. He said, the way I want us to approach this is using the one thing that we already do better than anybody else in Formula One. Attention to detail. That was our USP. He said, I want you all to go away, analyze everything that we do, everything you do as individuals and as a team and as groups within this team, analyze it in that forensic level of detail and then ask yourselves, why do we do something this certain way? And if the answer that comes back is, well, that's kind of how we've always done it, well, that was no longer good enough. Now we were being challenged to start thinking of new ways of doing things by our boss. And it wasn't our boss standing at the front saying, this is what we're going to do differently, guys. It was our boss standing there asking the staff, asking the people within the organisation, how should we go about doing this differently? Treating us as a valuable resource within the organisation. Because we're all full of ideas, aren't we? Everybody, every organisation has members of staff who are full of ideas. But how many organisations give those staff the freedom and the opportunity to put those ideas forward on a daily basis, on a regular basis, without fear of failure? We were encouraged to start taking risks and thinking outside the box. You know, this was about thinking in a different direction to the, op to the opposition, where everybody had pretty much been doing things a certain way for a long, long time. We were now being tasked with going off in a completely different angle. And Ron did encourage us to take risks. He said to us, We've got to start thinking outside the box. Come up with some different ideas. Take a risk because sometimes those risks, they won't, you know, they won't pay off. They won't work naturally. He said, but sometimes from those failures, if you call them failures, they, sometimes that is where the biggest opportunity will come. Because when you have a failure or when you have a disappointment, you delve into that failure in that level of attention to detail that we did best. And sometimes from that investigation comes the biggest opportunity. An opportunity that you would have never had if you'd never looked that deep into that area in the first place. So there was some scepticism, of course, at the beginning. People were are always reluctant to change and it took a little bit of time. But gradually, we started to get some ideas coming through. 
And this had to go through every single person in this organization, 800 people through every department. And I remember it going through the various management tiers and the R&D department, the manufacturing uh, part, part of McLaren. Eventually it got to the marketing department. And marketing perhaps had one of the, the biggest tasks in this particular period of change because you know, not only were they having to think outside the box and do things differently, but they were now having to draw in the investment that we still needed to go Formula One racing, an expensive business. Now they're having to draw that in up against competition from other global sports like football or tennis or rugby. Competition that we just hadn't had in the past from the tobacco era. So it was a tough, a tough sell for them. And they had to go away and start thinking differently about things and brought this picture of Lewis back because when I look at that picture of Lewis, I probably see something a bit different to you guys. Now, it's obviously Lewis having just won a Grand Prix. He's on the top step of the podium, spraying the champagne around. On that particular day, he's the best driver in the world. The first thing I notice is that he's wearing a watch. Now, I promise you, five minutes before that picture was taken, he didn't have that watch on because the, the engineers would have gone absolutely mad at what that weighs on his wrist in the car. But the head of marketing came to us at the end of a, a race one day. And he said, look, guys, we're missing a trick here. This is, you know, back in sort of 2005 time. He said, you know, what we, have, what, we, what we see when we look at drivers at the end of a Grand Prix, they've been strapped into a, a racing car for two hours. They're hot, they're sweaty, they're knackered. All they really want to do when they get out of the car is go and have a lie down. He said, if you look at the old photos and, and footage of them on the podium, that's exactly what they look like. They, they look disheveled, they looked rough, they looked hot and sweaty. They had their overalls tied in a, a sc scruffy knot around their waist. It didn't look like immaculate professionals is what we were supposed to be portraying ourselves at McLaren. So the marketing guy said, look, we've got to take Lewis to one side at the end of a race. We're going to give him a towel, dry him, dry him off. Sponsor's hat goes on. Of course, you see this all the time now, but you didn't see it then. We're going to make sure he's got his overalls done up right to the very top, even that little catch done up under his, under his chin. And we can then print the sponsor's logos in pristine fashion down the front. There's even a logo, a sponsor's logo on that catch very deliberately. We're going to give him the sponsor's watch. And that watch, very deliberately, goes on the outside of the cuffs of his overalls. Because then, when he's the best driver in the world, and that picture, or that video footage, is being seen by hundreds of millions of viewers all around the world, or on the back page of every newspaper, well then the boss of TAG, who's one of our customers, one of our clients, is all of a sudden a bit more of a happy customer. He's all of a sudden getting a little bit more value for money. It didn't cost him any more, it didn't cost Tag any more, and he still gets his sticker on the side of the car, of course, but now we were offering something a little bit extra. I mean, that's a tiny, tiny detail that I've just discussed there. It didn't cost us any money, of course. All we're doing is doing something a bit different. And anybody could have done this, but nobody else thought about it, because we had been thinking in a different way to the competition. Now, that was a tiny example, as I say. There were lots of these things I remember the marketing guys coming to us at the end of a race somewhere. When I was a mechanic in a race garage in a pit lane somewhere around the world, the marketing, head of marketing came into the garage and he said, he stood at the front and he said, guys, I've had a great idea. And that always worried me anyway. When the head of marketing comes in and says he's had a great idea, you never know what's coming next. But he said, look, what I want to do here, he said, I want to put in the middle of your race garage, your pit garage, a great big glass container. And in that glass container, we can put in there our VIP guests that come over the course of race weekend, and they can be in the glass container watching you guys work over your shoulder all weekend long. Uh, now you can imagine that went down like a lead balloon because as mechanics in this high pressure environment of the pit garage, where first of all, we didn't have space for this great big glass container, and secondly, who wants people staring over their shoulders all weekend long? It was a disastrous idea, so we said absolutely not. There's no way this can happen. We had this big fight back with marketing and it went on for a couple of weeks. Well, we said, There's just, it just can't happen. Go back to the drawing board. They said, it has to happen. We've been told to think out the, outside the box. This battle went on and on. Anyway, two weeks later at the next Grand Prix, this great big glass box appears. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, we had no choice but to deal with the lack of space, which we did. What was happening, obviously, now is that these VIP clients, these potential investors, these potential sponsors, who were clearly there with some interest in Formula One, were now in the heart of a Formula One garage where the cars were being assembled either side of them. The drivers being strapped in and screeching out the garages right under their noses. Pit stops were happening literally just a few feet away. They were getting this incredible money can't buy experience. And it was an experience, importantly, that nobody else in Formula One could offer. Not because nobody else could achieve it, but because nobody had thought about it. Nobody had thought differently 
to the way that we'd all been doing the same things over and over for years and years and years because up until that point we hadn't been pushed in any sort of different direction. And I'm telling you these little marketing stories because at the end of this period of time, you can see a, a sticker on a, a badge on Lewis's sleeve there from Vodafone. We landed a deal with Vodafone that was an unprecedented deal at the time in Formula One terms. It lasted for seven years and it brought us in more money than our tobacco sponsor had been giving us prior to that. And this was at a time when every other Formula One team was still squabbling amongst themselves about how they were going to survive this threat to the industry. So just by thinking a bit differently, looking at the, the change as an opportunity rather than a threat, we created ourselves a number of little advantages. And of course that you know, financially secured us for a number of years, which allows us then to start focusing on some of the other areas of our business. And eventually this process that I'm talking about that we, that we were going through, this process of self-analysis and of looking for different ways of doing things, eventually it reached us, the, the pit stop crew. And I remember at the time, as I said to you before, being a bit sceptical about that. We were quite an arrogant bunch, the pit stop crew. We were at McLaren, we'd probably been the, the, the fastest, the most consistent in terms of pit stops for a number of years. And we, and we knew it, <laughs> you know, we were quite big headed. We were quite arrogant, if I'm really honest about it. We were changing four wheels and tires in four seconds. And that was as quick as anybody could do it and had been able to do it for a long, long time. We were using pretty much the same set of equipment that everybody was using, our own version, but pretty much the same stuff but nobody could be as consistent and as fast as the McLaren team. So when Ron Dennis stands at the front of this gathering and says, looks at the pit stop crew, and he says, guys, we've got to find a way to be better at pit stops. Well, our first reaction was, well, hang on a minute, Ron. Why, why on earth do we need to be better? Because we're already the best. And secondly, we're talking about an event that lasts for four seconds. How on earth do you go about looking to improve on that? And of course, what Ron returned in his response was that he said, I can't tell you how to be better at pit stops. He said, I've never done a pit stop. He said, the only people who know how to be better at this four second event of a pit stop are the people doing the four second event. And he was putting that trust in us, in his staff, in the people within the organization, valuing that resource that were his people. Because nobody was right. Nobody knew better than how to do a pit stop than us. And when we got that information, we took it on as a challenge. It was something that, you know, we were a competitive bunch of people. Of course we were going to go away having been challenged and try and find ways to bring that four seconds down, even if it was by the tiniest amount. And it was about being consistent, not just about being as fast as we could. So we went away, we started to analyse everything about a Formula One pit stop. And I've got a video to show you in a moment of, of basically where we got to, bearing in mind we started at four seconds to change the, the four wheels and tyres. But first, before I show the video, I want to tell you quickly about my first ever pit stop, because the process of a pit stop before this period of change was completely different to the ones you might be familiar with if you watch the sport today. And my first pit stop will give you an idea of what that was like. I mean, I'd grown up as a, well, particularly as a teenager, just desperate to get into F1 and, and specifically desperate to be part of a Formula One pit stop crew. That was my goal in life at that age. And eventually, after working my way up through the motorsport ladder, I got my dream job at McLaren. I was still very young, 22 years old. I had no pit stop experience at that point. And so the team manager, when I got sent out to my first race, which is the Australian Grand Prix in Melbourne, the team manager gave me a job in the pit stop that doesn't even happen very often, like a rare, a rare occurrence. My job on that day was to put on the spare nose cone and front wing assembly, which only ever happens if the driver has an accident and knocks off the first one in the race. So really, really rare. And on that particular weekend, I mean, I was having looked forward to this for years, I was suddenly terrified going into that weekend. So the fact that it was a rare occurrence, I was actually quite happy with. And to give you an idea of how we treated pit stops back then, we used to practice once a week in the week building up to a Grand Prix. So in the pit lane in Melbourne, we would push the car out into the pit lane, into the box area, and we'd push it in and out and practice pit stops on a Wednesday afternoon. Now the process was this. The, the car would, would roll into the pit stop box, it would stop on the mark, somebody would then take off the broken nose cone, and I'd then come in with this nose cone and, and huge front wing, swing it into position, line it up on four pins on the front of the chassis where a couple of guys would do up the catches and then I'd leap out the way so that the front jack man could get in behind me to lower the car down onto the floor. That's how it should happen. <laughs> on this particular day, anything that could have gone wrong was going wrong. So I was, kinda, I was tripping over with this great big thing. I was clattering into the guy taking the first nose off. I was missing the four pins on the front of the car. A couple of times I hit the four pins and then let go of it before the catches was done up and it, 
kind of fell on the floor. I mean, it was a disaster. Everything that could have gone wrong just went wrong. I remember once, in fact, I did it perfectly, hit the four pins, the guys did the catches up, and I stood back admiring my own work for so long that the front jack man still couldn't get anywhere near the car, and it was still a disaster. So it was awful. Everything that could have possibly gone wrong happened, and I was terrified that that's what was going to go on in the race. So immediately after the practice, I went to the team manager, and his reaction to my concern tells you a bit about how we, we treated pit stops back then, because when I told him I was really worried that this was going to happen in race day on Sunday, the team manager's response was, he said, there's two things, Mark. He said, calm down. He said, two things. First of all, he said, it's highly unlikely that this is going to happen on Sunday, so calm down. And you can see where I'm going to go with this, can't you? <laughs> he said, secondly, if it does happen, he said, the driver's obviously had an accident. His race is probably ruined anyway. So he said, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Well, I did worry about it. I went away for the rest of the week, terrified. I got to Saturday night. I promise you, I did not sleep a wink on Saturday night because all I was doing was running through in my mind this disaster that we'd had in, in the practice. And I got to Sunday afternoon, race day. My driver at the time was Kimi Raikkonen. And I remember being on the grid in Melbourne, strapping Kimi into the car and wishing him luck at that point. And then I have to head back with my colleagues back to the pit lane from the grid, carrying all of the equipment like the front jacks and trolleys, all to be back in the garage ready in case of an early pit stop on the first lap. Now, as we're trundling back towards the pit lane, I can hear the cars doing their green flag lap. Eventually they form up on the grid. You then start to hear, I can't see any screens, but I can hear the engines of 20 cars bouncing off the rev limiter at 21,000 RPM. Incredible noise. And then you hear them all launch off the line and the race is underway. I'm still rushing back to the garage, all this stuff. Not five seconds after the lights had gone out and the cars had left the line, the earpiece in my ear bursts into life and the team manager comes on and he says, guys, get ready for a pit stop. Kimmy's had an accident at turn one and he's knocked his nose off. <laughs> he's coming in for a pit stop. And my whole world just stopped. And I, I completely remember going into blind panic mode. I ran back to this. Remember I told you the McLaren garage was always pristine and immaculately presented. Well, I turned up, launched all this equipment in there with no care for where it landed. Ron Dennis was still sat in the garage watching the screens of the start with all of these big wig sponsors around him. And there were front jacks and trolleys whizzing past his ear, creating this incredible mess in this beautiful, beautiful garage. I didn't care at that point. I ran out into the pit lane. I grabbed my balaclava, pulled it on. It was all sort of skew if. I could just see out of one eye. And I ran out to grab the, the uh, nose cone for Kimmy's car, ran out with that into the pit lane and stood there shaking like a leaf, terrified that this disaster was about to unfold, not only just in front of us as it was on Wednesday, but now in front of the world. Really, really panicking. And then I realised as I stood there shaking that I was there all by myself. And I turned to see all my colleagues, my much more experienced colleagues in the garage, first of all clearing up this mess that I had just created with all this stuff and quite leisurely getting themselves ready, knowing they had about a minute and a half while Kimmy in his broken car limped his way all the way around the racetrack and back to us in the pit lane. And at that point, you know, I couldn't go back in. So a minute and a half felt like an absolute lifetime. I'm suddenly imagining the, the kind of the back pages of tomorrow's newspaper with a McLaren disaster headline and a picture of me. Uh, these things were never going to happen, by the way, but that's what was going through my head. I was really beginning to panic. And then because I'm out there all by myself with all of the gear on and holding this great big nose cone and front wing, there's now a cameraman who's realised that we're about to do a pit stop. Now, I'm, I'm not exaggerating how close he was either. That's how close the lens was. I know that on the other end of that little lens, 350 million people, in my mind, were all just staring at me for the whole minute and a half. Now, again, clearly that's not what was happening because it would have made terrible TV, but that is what was going through my head. And now, I'm supposed to be focusing on this, what is actually a really simple job. And the reality is that any one of you in this room can pick up a nose cone, walk over to the front of a car, pop it onto four pins, and then walk away. That's the job. <laughs> but in that particular moment, it became the hardest job in the world. And all of this is tearing through my mind, and I'm, I'm panicking, I'm starting to, I'm sweating, running, sweat's running into my eyes, I can hardly see started to hyperventilate and eventually my colleagues all came out of the pit lane and joined me around the, the pit stop box and then Kimmy appears at the far end of the pit lane and starts trundling towards us at the pit lane speed limit which back then was 120 kilometers an hour so 70 miles an hour so I always say to people that's like standing in the fast lane of a motorway hoping that at the very last second he's going to stop there at your ankles terrifying stuff but the brakes on a Formula One car are so good that 15 meters away from you he's still doing 70 miles an hour 
I mean, it's terrifying. Still to this day, the scariest thing I've ever done in my entire life, I promise you. And that's saying something, because I've been married twice and got four kids. <laughs> um, terrifying stuff. Anyway, I stood there, I waited, the car turned up, it screeches to a halt perfectly, and everyone leaps into action. Somebody takes off the broken nose cone, and I then swing in with this great big thing, didn't trip over, didn't hit anybody, hit the four pins perfectly, somebody did the catches up, and I leapt out the way, and it was all over, it was done, and it could not have gone any better. It was the perfect pit stop. And I bounded off into the garage, pulled my balaclava off, I mean, the smile, the grin must just from ear to ear, I was so elated, so relieved. I was leaping around the garage like a kid at Christmas. And then I turned around to see that the car was still stationary in the pit lane. And it should have long gone by now. And what had happened was, in my own euphoria of leaping around the garage, I'd completely missed all of this radio traffic where Kimmy sat in the car, had been screaming at the engineers and back and forward, that when he'd gone off and had his accident gone into the gravel trap, a tiny stone, a tiny piece of the gravel trap, had leapt up in the air and gone down between his back and the seat of the car. And you're so tightly strapped into an F1 car that, first of all, that's too painful for him to, to continue with it in there. And secondly, he can't reach himself to get it out. So now this car sat on this pit stop box with the engine screaming away and about 15 people clambering all over it trying to fish out this one <laughs> tiny little stone. Eventually, somebody found it and threw it away and the car got back in the race. But by that point, it had been stationary for around about a minute and a half possibly McLaren's worst ever pit stop in their entire history. And yet when these now really angry, really grumpy and experienced mechanics came back into the garage, there's this young idiot <laughs> with a great big grin on his face just leaping around wanting to high five everybody because his little bit had gone really well. And it completely changed from that day forward my outlook on this process of a pit stop in that my little part in that process was just that, a tiny little bit. You know, it was a crucial bit because I could have easily made that pit stop a disaster all by myself on that particular day. Luckily, I didn't. But I was never going to make it the perfect pit stop by myself either because the only way that happens is when every single person and every single piece of equipment and every part of the process, all the training and the preparation and the planning, everything has to come together at exactly that right moment when you need it to happen to enable the perfect pit stop, as it was back then, a four-second pit stop. So when we fast forward a few years and we're looking at ways to improve on these four second pit stops, one of the first things we have to look at is the, the training regime. Because training once a week was just way too hit and miss. It was pure luck on that particular day that my bit went well. So now we train every single day. We have a, a scientific training regime that we follow. We treat the pit stop crew a bit more like athletes, like the drivers. We give them training regimes to follow, but also physical training regimes to follow. Dietary regimes that the teams now implement for the pit stop crew. Even sports psychiatrists are being used at some teams to get everybody and everything geared up to operate at their best, their peak physical and mental capacity at exactly the right time on a Sunday afternoon when it matters. And I remember at the time thinking, you know, when somebody was telling me, that I've got to have this for breakfast on a Sunday, how on earth could that possibly impact my pit stop, I was thinking. And, and it's only when you start to step back and look at it, you start to realize why it can. It's because it may not, it may not have a physical impact. Maybe it does, maybe it starts to, to change your, your body and you become fitter and healthier. And all those things obviously have an impact. But one of the biggest things for me was that my team, my pit stop crew knew that we had gone to greater lengths in our planning phase, in our preparation, than the, our competitors, which for us were 20 feet further down the pit lane, often doing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. If we burst out the garage knowing that we'd definitely gone to greater lengths than they had, if we'd put more time and more attention to detail into our planning and preparation than any of our competitors had, gives you an instant confidence boost. You start to puff your chest out, you start to believe that you are better because you've put the work in beforehand. The attention to detail has gone in. And that means the result you get out could well be better. And sometimes that psychological advantage of just knowing that you've gone to greater lengths than your main competitors, sometimes that can be the difference between winning and losing. So we went through this process of change and changing everything. And I, I talked about the human element, how we change that, the training, the psychological side, the, the, the physical side. But of course, we looked at the equipment as well. We went through that with the fine tooth comb, redesigned lots of it in a completely new way coming up with stuff from a blank sheet of paper, designing things specifically for the job, being led by the people that were doing the job. 
And I've got this video to show you now of basically where we got to. So bearing in mind, we were changing four wheels and tires in four seconds flat. Having gone through this period of change, we dramatically improved that. And the point I'm gonna make in a moment is that, of course, that advantage doesn't last forever because other people will see what you're doing. They start to copy what you're doing. They start to be led by your actions. But for a small time, we had that big advantage. And then, of course, it doesn't stop there. You've got to be constantly looking for the next opportunity. Sometimes those opportunities might be tiny, might be fractions of a second for us. They could be tiny details for, for you in retail, but they can all make a difference. But anyway, after starting at four seconds to change four wheels and tires and going through this period of change, this is where we got to as a result. Now it's impressive, isn't it? I hope you'll agree. Um, I mean, I find it impressive and I was part of that process and I still find it staggering that that's achievable. And even now we're dipping below two seconds and it's just an incredible feat of, of engineering but also of human performance. But the only way that happens is through that meticulous planning and preparation and attention to detail. The idea of leaving no stone unturned. And that's what gets you to a sub two second pit stop. Now that, as I said, this, uh, this process we were going through at McLaren that was one of the results of it. We gave ourselves a huge advantage in terms of pit stops. That had huge advantage didn't last forever, of course. As you saw, other people started to do the same things. But then we we're always looking for the next one, as I said, and we gradually we start to eke out more and more performance by the concept of thinking differently and by looking at the tiny, tiny details. Whilst all that's going on, of course, when you're going through any period of change in any organization, it's really easy sometimes to focus on the perhaps the big ticket items, the really visual items, the periphery items. But it's really easy to not or to lose focus on perhaps what might be your main, your main product or your main core function. Now for us at a Formula One team, our main function is to design and manufacture and then develop and, and race these two Formula One cars, of course. And it's really important. We don't lose focus of all of that. So the main point of that is that we've got to design and manufacture fast, reliable race cars, just like every other team is trying to do. Now in 2005, I was now in charge of Kimi Raikkonen's car and we went through a, a championship battle with Fernando Alonso in his Renault where we as McLaren lost out in the, the dying races of that season. Right at the end of the season, we lost out narrowly to Fernando Alonso in the Renault. And it was heartbreaking stuff for us. We were passionate about racing. Winning the championship was the holy grail of within Formula One. There's nothing better than that. It's the biggest achievement we could achieve. And so to lose out that, that, that narrowly was heartbreaking. So we get to 2006, looking for the perfect start to the season, looking for to go that one step better and finally take this, this coveted world title. So over the course of the winter between 2005, 2006, we're looking for the perfect start. We're looking to develop this brilliant car, fast car, reliable car. It's gotta be the perfect start. We've gotta be ready for the first race of the season. And I'm on the race team. We, do, we hardly spend much time in our factory. We're going from racetrack to racetrack to racetrack. Already been away from home for months by the time we get to the first Grand Prix through all the development and testing that we go through. Now I get to the first race of 2006, the Bahrain Grand Prix. I send Kimi's car out for qualifying, looking for this perfect start, and that happened. Now that wasn't Kimi crashing into somebody or something, that was Kimi's car falling apart. And when I looked into what had happened and we investigated it, one of the parts that we make ourselves, a suspension component, a wishbone on the back of that car, carbon fiber wishbone that has a steel joint bonded into the end of it, well somehow in that production line process, the steel joint had just been missed in terms of the bonding process of bonding it into the carbon fiber wishbone. And incredibly, it had been passed down the production line, somehow got through a layer of inspection or two, and been sent out to us at the racetrack where we'd put it on a car, and that was a result. We didn't qualify, we started the race from last, we scored no points that weekend, it was a disastrous way to start your championship campaign. And I was angry when I found out why this had happened, or how this had happened. Somebody in my team, one of my teammates, not somebody I knew, not somebody I ever came into contact with, because I didn't work with them directly. They were based back in our factory, somewhere I never went. But one of my teammates had let us down in 
perhaps one of the most dramatic and serious ways possible. It's a simple error, a simple oversight, but the consequence was, was dramatic. Cost us a race. So I decided I was going to go back to our factory and try and understand how on earth in this big organisation of McLaren this could possibly have happened. So I went back to the, the factory. This is the inside of that building I showed you earlier. Hugely impressive facility, as I said, spotless everywhere. And now, I imagined, having not spent much time in here, that if you come into this place every single day as a Formula One fan, that, you know, I was a massive Formula One fan, and you walk past this iconic lineup of historic Formula One cars, I imagine there can be nothing much more inspirational than that sight every single morning coming into work. When I got talking to people in here, trying to understand what life was like for the other half of my team, trying to understand what life was like in this factory, I was amazed to find that not all of these people were Formula One fans. Lots of them were just turning up, clocking in in the morning, doing a job that we'd asked them to do, and then clock out at the end of the day and going home, kind of forgetting about it in between. Lots of them didn't see that as an iconic lineup of historic cars. Lots of them saw it as spoiling the view of that lovely lake out the front there when they were trying to work behind this glass. And I was amazed at that. I didn't realise that we had this big split between the race team, this passionate part of the team who gave up everything, sacrificed time at home, time with family to be away racing because that's what we loved and that's what we were passionate about. And the other half of our organisation who perhaps were just doing a job. And I realised that if that was the case, we couldn't be the best Formula One team that we could be because there was this huge disconnect between the people working in here and the end product, which for us was the race. I was amazed to find that lots of these people clocked out of work on a Friday, went home, some of them didn't even bother to turn the TV on to watch the Grand Prix on a Sunday, and they'd come back in on a Monday not even knowing what the result was, not even knowing how our team had got on in, in the race on a Sunday. Now that really blew me away, and when I heard that, I decided I was going to have to go and tell my boss, Ron Dennis, the, the CEO of the company, this guy who's trying to lead this revolution, if you like, of us being the best we could be, going off in a different direction to every other Formula One team. He was a guy that was a scary man to work for. You know, his attention to detail was second to none. And I was about to go into his office and tell him that there were some serious failings on the floor beneath where he sat. Now, I'd never been to his office before. It's a place you only go if you're in trouble, really. And I, I kind of imagined that he works in this great big circular room with a, him sitting in a black leather chair stroking a white cat. You know, that was, that was my impression of what his office must be like. And I was going in there to tell him that, you know, there were problems within this organisation that he probably thought was perfect. And I went in there, I made an appointment, I sat down, I talked at him for probably 15 minutes. And I was terrified to stop talking because I didn't know what he was going to say when I got to the end. And eventually I kind of ran out of words and I had to stop. And he sat there for probably 10 seconds without saying anything and then just said, thank you. And he said, you know what? He said, I walk around this place. You know, he said, I see people. I said, I walk along here. And he said, I'll see people in the distance panicking when they see me coming, sweeping things off the desk, shoving them into cupboards, tidying up, making it look immaculate. He said, I'll get down there and I'll say to them, how's it going, guys? And they'll all say, well, look around you, Ron. It's perfect. Look at it. It's spotless. It's perfect. Exactly how you like it. He said, what you're telling me is things are far from perfect. He said, it looks perfect at all times, but that's hardly really the point. He said, that's only one tiny part of it. He said, if we're not producing fast, reliable racing cars, if we've not got a happy, productive team within this organisation, we cannot be the best Formula One team. It doesn't matter how the place looks when you get to that point. So we identified the problem as being that lots of people in this building had no relationship with the end product. They didn't realise or have any appreciation of where they fitted in to this whole great big picture. They could have been making parts for washing machines for all they cared, some of them, when it left their workstation and went on down the production line. And that was a massive problem. So we decided we had to reconnect the two. And we did that by organising this monthly meeting or monthly forum where we got everybody from the factory floor who had an idea for improvement. Any idea, no matter what, it could have been anything, small or large. It could have been within their own department or an idea to, to improve something else within the organisation. And instead of that just being filtered into the, the system that we had, that was people coming to a monthly meeting where we'd cut out all the bureaucracy and red tape and have the senior management, Ron and his team, at this meeting, the people who could act and make decisions and make changes. And gradually we got some ideas coming through. We've got some good ones. We've got some silly ones, of course. But there's one idea I want to leave you with that really changed the game for me. And it was a guy, I don't even know what he did, this guy who worked in the corner of this factory, we'll call him Joe Bloggs, I don't know what he did, 
He, people walked past him every day on the way to the canteen. Nobody knew him, didn't know what he was, what he did. But he brought this idea along to, a, to one of these meetings. And at the first, it seemed like a really simple, innocuous idea. The idea was part of a, a digitization process, but it was streamlining the logistics process that we had at McLaren. And, you know, on the face of it, it was hard to sort of put a connection to that and the end product. How on earth was that really going to help us win Grand Prix? But then when you start to expand on that, we started to realize that we had a process or a system at McLaren where if we had an idea in the drawing office, in the design office, that maybe would come up with a new front wing, for example, that could bring performance to our F1 car. Well, that might take us six to eight weeks between having the idea, passing it through the system, getting it designed, manufactured, tested, and then made and onto a Formula One car on the other side of the world, six to eight weeks before we could bring the performance to the Formula One car. And that's what everybody in Formula One was working towards. Well, by implementing this streamlined logistics system, a much, much simpler way of doing things, which on the face of it was really easy to achieve, but nobody had thought about doing it. By doing that, we managed to cut that period of time down to a week. We could have an idea on a Monday, have the thing fast forwarded through the system and on a car, having been tested and manufactured on the other side of the world by that following weekend. So we were bringing performance to our car far quicker than anybody else in Formula One could achieve it. And the one thing I got Ron to do, which really cemented this to everybody's, in everybody's minds, was that when we had a great result, wherever we were, or wherever racetrack we were in the world, I got Ron to shout about this very publicly in press releases and in post-race interviews about where this performance had started from, where it had come from. So Joe Bloggs, who sits in the corner of our factory, was being name-checked in these press releases and TV interviews as being the guy who started the ball rolling that brought us this this developed idea that brought us the performance in the car. And it had two impacts. First of all, Joe Bloggs got quite a big head because he was suddenly famous around the world. But secondly, and far more importantly, everybody within that factory saw that Joe Bloggs had just changed the outcome of one of the world's biggest sporting events, the Formula One Grand Prix, just by putting his ideas forward, just by taking his ideas to the management. And management had acted on those ideas in the most public way possible. So everybody in here could see that, well, if Joe Bloggs can affect you know, one of the world's biggest sporting events, well, so can I, because we've all got ideas. So we all start to bring these ideas forward. And it began to gradually snowball. And over the course of 2007, by the time we got this thing up and running, by the end of 2007, we had the fastest car within the Formula One pit lane. We lost out in the championship narrowly for a number of other reasons, but certainly not because we weren't the most productive and the most efficient. And in 2008, so just two years after Lewis Hamilton had joined Formula One as this young rookie, by just six months or a year after we'd implemented this new way of doing things, we became world champions. We won the world title with Lewis Hamilton, who was a rookie just 12 months earlier. And the best thing about that champagne, because it was the sweetest champagne that I've ever tasted, the best thing about that wasn't that we won that world championship through spending hundreds of millions of dollars more than any other Formula One team. We did it through thinking a little bit differently to every other Formula One team. And it didn't cost us very much money to do that. It was just about planting the seed within your organization. It's about giving your staff the freedom to think differently, to think outside the box, to come up with ideas. It's about treating the 800 people in that organization as a massive resource that we had not been tapping into at that point. That was why we won the world title. By the end of that period of time, we were connecting up the two halves of our team. We had the people in our factory linked up to the people at the racetrack, the two halves of the team, with CCTV and, and, and much slicker communications. We were able to rely on each other, to trust in each other, to lean on each other, and to use each other as this valuable resource. And by the end of that period of time, we had people clocking out of work on a Friday, going home, coming back in on a Sunday with their families to watch the Grand Prix on a great big screen that we were putting up inside the factory. People were becoming proud to be part of this big Formula One team, McLaren, one of the most successful F1 teams in the world. Something that people hadn't been proud of up until that point. So I'm going to leave it there, but the message I hope you take away from this is that your staff, your people within any organisation are by far the biggest resource that you have at your disposal. And they don't cost anything to tap into that. You've got them already. Treat them well, empower them, give them the ability to utilise their experiences, their knowledge, you know, some of their backgrounds will be vastly more experienced than yours. If you don't give them the opportunity to tap into that, 
then you'll never understand what power they might be able to behold. Attention to detail, the other one, the preparation, the planning. Put more attention to detail in than any of your competitors and you'll get more out. Those were the ingredients of our World Championship and I hope they can be the ingredients of you being a successful business. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a bit of time for questions if anyone's got it from the audience. 